I'm Kiala Kennelly and I'm a surfer. More than just a surfer, but it's mostly because of my surfing that I'm here. Throughout my life, many people have said that I'm the only woman that does the kind of surfing that I do. But it can be kind of lonely when you're the only one, so I'm gonna start off by trying to shrink the space between us and describe to you what it feels like to be on a wave like that. Everyone always asks me, what does it feel like? I guess because they want to know what drives me to throw myself in these life-threatening situations. It's hard to describe, but I'm going to take a crack at it. When you ride inside a wave, you have the energy of all of that water swirling around you. You can feel the raw power of nature. It is one of the most exhilarating feelings you can take in. With a bigger wave, there's more water moving around you, and the intensity of that feeling is multiplied. Time slows down, some of your senses like smell, taste, and sound fade away, while others are so incredibly heightened, you feel like you have superhuman powers. Your sight has pinpoint precision focus, and your sense of touch is so amplified, you can feel every drop of water on that wave and can anticipate how it's gonna move. You become in sync. In that moment, I feel connected to everything in the world, and when I get spit out of the wave for a few moments, I feel like I'm the master of the universe. But I'm not the master of the universe. So when that moment passes, I go back to being a woman in a male-dominated sport, a lesbian in a, in a sport that favors heteros, and a domestic partner that will probably be in the doghouse for skipping out of my parental duties to chase this swell. Let me tell you where I came from so you can understand my story. I grew up in Kauai with two brothers. I was surrounded by a lot of strong male influences, like my dad. I was a total tomboy, imagine that. And I wanted to do everything the boys were doing. I could catch a football better than half the guys I would play with, but I was told, girls can't play football, it's, it's only for boys. As human beings, when we desire something and then we're told we can't have it, what happens? It makes us desire it more. That's where it started for me being told that I couldn't do things because I was a girl. My dad taught me and my brothers how to surf really early on, and I really fell in love with it. I knew right away that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and my family was very supportive. Even though surfing was a male-dominated sport and it was really hard for a woman to be respected in the sport, I didn't care. I knew in my heart that this was my gift, and the better I got at it, the better I felt about myself, and the better I felt about my life. In Hawaii, the waves are some of the biggest and most powerful in the world. Me and the boys I surfed with were constantly challenging ourselves to go bigger. I love the way surfing made me feel, but when I was riding a bigger, heavier wave, it challenged me physically and mentally in a way that normal waves couldn't. Big wave surfing is very dangerous, and at the time was considered a men's only sport. When I would go surf some of the heavier reef breaks, I'd be the only girl in the water with all the boys. I was surfing waves and breaks that the surfing world had previously thought women couldn't handle and quickly developed a reputation as one of the only women that was pushing the limits in these kind of waves. I knew that this was my purpose. The only problem was if I wanted to make surfing my career, I was gonna have to do the competition circuit. I spent a lot of years on the ASB World Tour and had a very successful competitive career. But the tour was a means to an end for me. It allowed me to have sponsors and make money surfing, but I wasn't doing the kind of surfing that I was passionate about. My best surfing was not coming out in contests except for the rare occasion when we would have a big swell during an event. Without intending to, I had traded my passion for a paycheck. There's nothing more frustrating than knowing you have a gift that sets you apart and not being able to utilize it, and it was a constant struggle for me. That wasn't the only thing I was struggling with on tour. I was making a big personal sacrifice as well. The ASP World Tour and the surfing industry in general were really down on homosexual athletes. Lesbians were very frowned upon. They didn't win world titles or have good endorsement deals. 
When I started the tour, I had a boyfriend, but it was becoming obvious as I got older that I preferred women. So out of fear, I decided if I wanted to have a successful career, I would need to stay in the closet. I felt so stuck on the tour. I felt like a horse on a merry-go-round. There were the ups and downs of winning and losing, but for the most part, it just went round and round in a circle. You knew exactly where you were going, you just followed the other horses in front of you. I didn't want to follow the other horses anymore. This little pony wanted to get that pull out of my ass and run free. <laughs> An event got added in Tahiti that became a game changer for me. This way of Chiopu was really unique because it breaks on an outer reef. Swells go from really deep water to very shallow water very quickly. And when they hit this reef, the water bends over on top of itself and creates an incredibly thick, hollow, and extremely powerful wave. It, is one of the most, it was one of the heaviest and most dangerous waves on the planet, but it is also one of the most beautiful. Over the years, this wave became the place where I had my greatest triumphs on tour and even greater triumphs when I finally left the tour. And as every yin must have its yang, Cho Chopo almost became, Chopo also became the place of some of my worst nightmares. First time I went there, I almost died. I was so excited to ride that beautiful wave that I didn't realize how big it actually was that day. I got caught inside of a wave that looks like this and it landed on me. It broke my board in three pieces and pinned me down on the reef with so much force that I couldn't move. I was held down for two waves, saw my life flash before my eyes, and I thought, man, this is it. I felt so defeated in that moment because for the first time I thought, maybe I have reached the limit of what I can do because I'm a girl. Just as I was about to give up, I found the strength in me to fight for my life and was able to save myself. I returned to Chopu every year, dominated there when it was big, but it took me many years before I found the courage to attempt to ride it again at that massive size. I believed in myself and my ability. If I could just get over the fear of what happened or what could happen, I knew I could get the ride of my life. During another massive swell, I borrowed a tow board and, and convinced one of the guys driving a ski to give me a turn. The rest is history. Before that day, nobody thought a woman could ride waves of this size at this break. I proved first to myself and then to the rest of the world that yes, it is possible. When I towed into that first big wave at Chopes, got inside the barrel and came blasting out, I felt the most incredible feeling I'd ever felt. It made me feel truly alive. Every time I've gone back and got a ride like that, I get to experience that feeling again. But I always have to overcome the fear. People think that because I like to ride these massive life-threatening waves, that I have no fear. Nothing could be further from the truth. I am terrified of this wave. This wave has almost killed me. I've had horrific injuries at the hands of this wave, some that have scarred me for life. So why do I do it? Why do I keep going back and putting my life in danger? Sometimes I ponder that question in my own head, and the answer always speaks to me loud and clear. I go back because once you've felt something like that and you know that it exists, it's impossible to act as if it's not there. There will forever be a gnawing at your soul telling you there is something more. That wave haunts me. It haunts me in a way that terrifies me because I know what the consequences are if I mess up out there. But it also seduces me because that wave offers a heightened feeling of being alive. That feeling I am truly addicted to. My desire to feel that becomes stronger than the fear. It may take a while to stand up to your fears, but once you do, it's hard to live any other way. A year after my first tow ride at Chopes, I left the tour, I stopped hiding the fact that I was gay. I lost three out of four of my sponsors and have spent the last five years of my life chasing big waves. I'm following my passion again, but the challenges I face while I pursue my passions are sometimes more difficult to me than riding these waves. That said, my challenges remind me of who I am every time I push them aside and decide they won't win over my desires. I think that in life, we all fall victim to letting money and financial security stand in the way of what we truly desire. It causes us to make choices that aren't in line with what our heart is telling us to do. What would you be doing if money was no object? What did you want to do before your life, be 
What did you want to do with your life before you became aware that the world was full of starving artists, mu musicians, and poets? Every day people do things that have no prize money check, no financial reward, but if what they are doing is making them come alive, the personal satisfaction from that is the reward. It's something that money can't buy. Real desire can't be bought because it comes from within. The way you fulfill your desire is not by investing in things, but by investing in yourself. By staying true to yourself, doing what you love, and most importantly, not letting your gifts go to waste. I've had to sacrifice a lot to stay in a committed relationship with my passion, but I'm here today to tell you it's worth it. Thank you.